Hi guys, I am CS Adrata from Aru Pro Academy. Today in this video, we are going to learn about the essentials of a valid contract. Let's look at the first point. The first point is minimum two parties. Who are the two parties who require to be there to make a contract valid? The offerer and the offeree. The offerer is the person who offers to enter into a contract and the offeree needs to give his acceptance. So this becomes the very first essential of a valid contract. The next one is intention to create legal relationship. What is intention to create legal relationship? The intention that the parties will have if the performance of the contract is not possible or it is not done or one party uh, goes against their words, then the other party who may have suffered a loss can sue the party who has not performed the contract. For example, if A enters into a contract with B to sell his car to him for rupees 1 lakh. Now, if B takes the car and does not pay the amount promised to A, that is 1 lakh, A can sue B for such non-performance. This is called legal relationship. Now, there are certain exceptions to legal relationship where it is not required like a domestic contract or a personal contract or a contract which is made for the purpose of charity etc. The third essential of a valid contract is lawful consideration. What is lawful consideration? Lawful means something which is not forbidden by law or which is not prohibited by law. So consideration means quid pro quo that is something in return. So lawful consideration is something, any consideration which is not forbidden by the law or not prohibited by the law. Let's take an example. If A tells B that I will sell you my car and I want you to give me 1 kg of weed. So we know that weed in India is illegal. So if this becomes a contract, then there will be a lot of trouble. Hence, the consideration that weed is is not legal hence it becomes an illegal consideration let's look at the third point the third point is competency of the parties what is competence competency means someone who is eligible to enter into a contract now the law does not say who can enter into a contract the law says who cannot enter into a contract the first person who cannot enter into a contract is a minor a minor is somebody who is below the age of 18. Now, a minor cannot enter into a contract. That would be a little dicey to understand. What happens is a minor is not prohibited to enter into contract. But the moment a minor enters into a contract with a major person and anything that may have gone wrong into the contract will be the liability of the major. That means the person who is above the age of 18 will not be allowed to compel the minor to perform on such contract. That would mean that the legal relationship is not properly created. Hence, a contract with a minor is little dangerous. However, there is a doctrine of restitution. That means if the minor has taken up something from the other person who is a major, and has not paid, say A is a minor and B is a major. A goes to the shop and purchases a toy and the price of the toy is rupees 500. A says that I will pay you the amount tomorrow. However, A does not pay the money to B the next day. Upon being sued in the court of law, what does the court say? The court says that A you must return the toy to B. Now, A cannot be compelled to pay the money. That is why a contract with a minor, we must think about it. The second person who is incompetent to enter into a contract is an unsound mind. What is a sound mind? A sound mind is nothing but any person who can take rational judgments. That means what is to be done in a certain situation by a person who can understand something in a normal sense. So anybody who is incapable of making rational judgments will be a person of unsound mind. Who are those guys? There are majorly three people 
who are unsound mind. For example, drunkard, a person who is under the influence of alcohol, shall not be eligible to enter into a contract. Therefore, a person who is of sound mind entering into a contract with a person who is drunk will not be able to compel such person to perform on such contract later. The second person who is of unsound mind is an idiot. Now that might sound funny, but an idiot is a person who is completely unsound. That means this person does not have any breaks of sanity. This person is permanently insane. They cannot take rational judgments ever. So this person, you may find him in a mental hospital. Now, these persons cannot enter into contracts. The third person is lunatics. Lunatics are also similar to idiots, but lunatics have breaks of sanity. That means at times they are capable of making rational judgments. In short, these people have seizures, like they may become, they may get scared or at when they see fire or they may get scared when they see a dog barking at them. So at that time, if you ask them to sign an agreement uh, to enter into a contract with you, will really not make much sense to this person. And that person doing anything under the influence of that fear or under the influence of that seizure would prove him to be an unsound mind. Hence, these three people are unsound mind. Third category is others. So what is that others category? The first one is an alien enemy. An alien enemy is not somebody who comes down from Mars, Mercury, Neptune, etc. However, this person belongs to a country who is right now at war with India. So when we enter into a contract with a person who lives in a country which does not have very social terms with our country, then such contract will not be a valid contract. For example, if a person is from India, enters into a contract with a country, for example, X country. Say X country had caused a terrorist attack on India. And now we would have already entered into a contract much before the terrorist attack. The situation between X country and India is not so good. What happens here? The contract will freeze. The contract is not valid until and unless the tensions are sorted, right? So this means that this contract cannot be performed upon. So the person from X country becomes an alien enemy to the person in India. The second one is a convict. What is a convict? A convict is a person who has been imprisoned in the jail. What does this mean? The court has punished him for a certain offense and he is in jail for committing a certain offense which is not allowed by the law. So offense is something which is not allowed by law. Now any person who is in jail right now cannot enter into a contract. He is incapacitated to enter into a contract. Let us say X is a film actor. Now X has a lot of contracts, lot of movies coming up for which he needs to start shooting. Now, there was a certain issue with which X was involved and court found him guilty and put him behind bars. So what happens here? Can X perform on the contract which we entered before going to the jail? Definitely no. So what happens here is this person can come out of the jail on parole and shoot or the producer must wait till the time of the till the jail time is over. So this person being in the jail is called a convict and cannot enter into a contract. Who is the other guy? The other guy is insolvent. Now an insolvent is a person who is unable to pay his debts. He declares himself, himself as an insolvent in the court. And the court, after looking at all the documents, if they find that this person is actually telling the truth, that means he does not have the money, they will adjudge him insolvent. Now, a person who does not have money, why would I want to enter into a contract with that person? Because tomorrow something wrong happens with the contract. I would want to go to the court and I would want a remedy. I would want a compensation for the breach of the contract. And this person who does not 
have the capacity of paying off his current debts, how can we assume him to perform on a contract? Hence, the Contracts Act has left him out of the capacity to enter into a contract. So these guys are not allowed to enter into a contract. Let's look at the next point. The next point is free consent. Now, what is free consent? Free consent means when two parties enter into a contract with their free will, that means there is no external pressure, there is no emotional trauma, there is no emotional torture, there is no uh, torture by threat to life, etc., etc. Now, the law again does not tell me what is free consent. The law tells me what is not free consent. So that means there are certain elements when they are present in an agreement that will never become a contract, right? Let's look at them. The first one is coercion. Coercion is given under Section 15 of the Indian Contracts Act. So what is coercion? Coercion is nothing but a threat to one's life or property or to another's life or property. Say for example, if I tell you now that at the gunpoint, you must sign this agreement and I will pay you 5 lakh rupees for selling me your house. What happens here? You may sign the contract because you're scared that I might kill you. So me threatening you is coercion. This is an external pressure. So had this pressure not been on you, you would not have entered into the contract. Let's say I tell you I, am, I have planted a bomb in XYZ mall. If you do not sell me this property, I would have to click only one button in my phone and the mall would blast. A lot of people would die. So you are a nice citizen. You are a good citizen of India. You want to save those people. You want to save those lives. Now, because I may have called off a bluff, I may have lied to you, but you believe that whatever I said is right and you enter into the contract because of such fear. This is coercion. This, if proved in the court of law, cannot state a contract to be valid. The next one where there is no free consent is undue influence. Now, undue influence is influencing somebody over and above the normal level. Who can do that? Somebody who has dominance over me or somebody who is superior to me. For example, a teacher and student relationship. Another example could be a company secretary and a client a lawyer and a client, a chartered accountant and a client. So I am trying to tell you that superiority could be either by employer-employee relationship or it could also be where we go to a person to seek advice because that certain person has extra knowledge. Now this knowledge should not be just because of age etc. However, this knowledge should be defined by virtue of some professional degree or some educational quality. So when you go to a CS and you tell that person that I want to incorporate a company. So you will assume that the company secretary knows about the incorporation procedure and would guide you properly. Say by mistake, this person forgets an important document that requires to be signed by the director. And you file the documents with the ROC and your documents are rejected. The question is, can I hold the company secretary responsible? Definitely yes, because I went to you because of your expertise. Now, definitely you have not worked accordingly and I had to pay the money twice. I had to pay the fee twice or my application was rejected because of which I could not incorporate my company on time. This, if proved in the court of law, it will become undue influence. The third category of free consent is fraud. Now, what is fraud? Fraud is something when somebody intentionally does something to you or says something to you or makes you believe into something which is actually not true. There are three important points under fraud that we need to keep a check on. The first one is concealment. Concealment means to hide something, to not say something. Second point is intention. There should be intention behind concealing it. It, it should not be unintentional concealment, right? And the third one is deception. Deception means cheating, okay? Fraud constitutes only on the basis of these three points. That is concealment, intention, and deception. Now, all these three 
should be within the knowledge of the person committing such fraud. If proved in the court of law, this will make the contract invalid. It may make it voidable. The fourth element that is there under free consent is misrepresentation. What is misrepresentation? Misrepresentation can be looked at as innocent fraud. Now, what is innocent fraud? What is misrepresentation? Misrepresentation is something which is the representation of a certain fact by a person who believes that the fact represented is true. Right? Now, this might sound a bit confusing. Let's take an example. So, I go to a shop and I ask the shopkeeper, do you have mangoes? Now, this shopkeeper does not understand English. He only knows the local language. When I say, do you have mangoes? He says, yes, I have. And I tell him, pack one kg. What is the price? He tells, one kg mango is 100 rupees. Now, this person is learning English, all right? So mango and strawberry got mixed up in his head and he gave me one kg strawberries instead of mangoes. What happened here? Did he have an intention to cheat? Definitely no, because we all know strawberries would be expensive than mangoes. No shopkeeper would want to have a loss. So here there was a genuine belief that the strawberries that he's selling me are mangoes. So this is a case of misrepresentation. He represented the strawberries to be mangoes because he believed they were mangoes, not because he wanted to cheat. So that is the main difference between a fraud and a misrepresentation. The final one is mistake. Now, what is a mistake? A mistake is nothing but an agreement which is formed on the basis of an erroneous belief or a misconception. Now, what is misconception? What is erroneous belief? That means there is consensus at idol is missing. What is consensus at idol? That means meeting of minds did not happen. That means the offer was not understood by the offeree in the same sense as the offerer meant it to be. So this means the minds of the offerer and the offeree could not come to the consensus could not meet at the same point now mistake could be of two types mistake of law mistake of fact mistake of fact let's take an example say i want to purchase a horse so i go to a person who sells horses and i tell him sir i would like to buy a horse he does not ask me any question neither do i tell him anything However, while he is showing me all the horses that he has, I place my hand on a brown color horse and I say that the black one over there is very beautiful and I would like to buy that. The seller confuses and he thinks that I have confused the brown to be black. Then he sends the brown horse to my house without checking whether the brown horse was the one which I had purchased, I send him the money. What happened here? The contract was formed because of a misconception. The seller could not understand that I actually meant the black horse and I pointed out towards it. He never probably saw it. And that is where that contract was entered on the basis of mistake. Right? So this contract did not have free consent. This contract did not have consensus ad item. That means meeting of minds never happened. Why is it a mistake of fact? Because the fact about the color of the horse that I would purchase or want to purchase could not be communicated to the seller. He misunderstood that part, right? The next one is mistake of law. Now, what is mistake of law? When a person ignores the law or when a person does not have knowledge of the law. So if you're an Indian and you live in India and you take, you board a train without buying the tickets, 
and the ticket checker comes and finds you without the ticket. Can you say that I'm sorry, this is my first time I'm getting into a train and I have no clue that we have to purchase a ticket? Definitely not. There is a term, ignorantia juris non excusa. That means ignorance of the law is definitely non excusable. So you will be penalized right there. So mistake of law, especially being in India and Indian law is absolutely a no-no. What is the next item which will lend me a non-validity on a contract? The next one is possibility of performance. What is possibility of performance? Possibility of performance means whatever contract we have entered, there are two parties. There is a reciprocal promise that has happened. That means one person has promised to give the subject matter and the other person promises to give the consideration. So now we have to ensure that the promises are performable. For example, if A tells B, I will sell you one kg stars, which stars, twinkle, twinkle, little stars for rupees two lakhs. And B agrees, can A ever sell stars to B? Definitely no. So in this case, this agreement is absolutely not valid due to lack of performability. The next point is certainty. What is certainty? Certainty means that the terms of the contract must not be ambiguous. It must be unambiguous. That means there should not be any hint of confusion. For example, if I tell you, if you wash my car, I will pay you something. That does not become an agreement. That does not become an offer at all because something is not defined. Consideration is not defined. Hence, this contract will never happen. This will remain an agreement, maybe just an offer. The last one is void agreement. So the Contracts Act specifies few agreements to be void agreements. Void agreement means an agreement which could never become a contract. There was a certain element which was missing in it and hence it became a void agreement as if it never existed, as if it is a zero, it is null and void. I'm sure all of you would have heard the term null and void. So an agreement which could never climb a ladder of enforceability and become a contract is called a void agreement. Some examples could be restraint of marriage. A tells B, if you don't marry C, I will pay you one lakh rupees. If B goes and marries C, A cannot sue B. Also the other way around, if B does not marry C and claims the money from A, A is not bound to pay because it is not a contract. Another example could be a contract without consideration. So already we know Consideration is important, but remind you, lawful consideration is important. However, there are certain exceptions where without a consideration also a contract is valid, which we will see in a different video. But here, any contract where no consideration is there will become a void agreement. That is the general rule of a contract. Another example could be a mutual mistake. Mutual mistake means where both the parties are under a mistake. That is a bilateral mistake. Whenever there is a bilateral mistake, there has not been any contract. It remains only an agreement. I said an unilateral mistake could make it a voidable contract. But a bilateral mistake will be definitely a void agreement. Example, if A tells B, I will sell you the horse. Neither A says what horse, what gender, what color, nothing. B assumes the horse to be black. And when the horse is delivered to, him, to B's house, B is shocked. It is a white color horse. And the price is extremely high. He's charging one crore rupees as if the horse is some diamond studded. Now, this becomes a void agreement because there was no mutual consent. There was no understanding of both the parties. So, both the parties were under mistake. That is why it is a void agreement.
I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much.